So, you know, we have heard from a lot of speakers, heard from a lot, a lot from each other. So what does this all mean in our community? So we're going to be um, hosting a panel discussion today where we will be talking about strategies for mitigating natural disasters and rapidly increasing of local food pro production. They're each extraordinary leaders and will introduce themselves as they tell you about their work. So this is about, this is gonna take us about 45 minutes, so stay put. And um, I, I just wanna name the folks that are gonna be part of the panel. And I think in the Zoom, we're gonna be seeing them um, uh, pin or feature. So Matthew uh, Teotimes, who is a tribal biologi biologist, a Gabrielino, a band of Mission Indians, and the Kish Nation. We're also gonna have Alison Fresini. She's the policy advisor and chief sustainability officer uh, for the County of Los Angeles. And we're gonna hear from Moses Massenberg, and he's a historian of African-American women's uh, history in urban community garden and farmer. And also Nathan Alou, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Mongol tribe, and Kua K. Wildcat, who is an agroecologist. So, all right, I think we're going to have all those folks now in um, being part of our panel for about 45 minutes. And I don't know if you guys can see, I'm timing, um, I'm using this timer over here. Do you see it on my top right? You guys all see it in my screen? Okay, beautiful. So that you can kind of keep an eye on the time because sometimes the conversations are so rich. It's easy to lose sight of time. So welcome everyone. And um, please, in let's start by um, in the order that I see folks here in my screen. So Matt, would you like to start and introduce yourself even though we heard from you earlier, but just a brief reintroduction. Yes, thank you so much for inviting us to this conversation. This is actually the first time we've been invited to a conversation like this. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Matthew Tutimez. I'm the son of John Tutimez, elder of the Gabriel Obama Mission Indians Keech Nation. Uh, my uncle is our chief, uh, uh, recently passed on. Um, I uh, am founder of a Laboratory for Indigenous Knowledge Systems. Uh, this is a um, nonprofit that we uh, utilize indigenous knowledge for environmental stewardship practices within LA County um, uh, for the purpose of food, medicine, and renewable products uh, that we create out of the trash that is being thrown away by our agencies. Uh, we work alongside um, different agencies as well as uh, uh, state parks and, and public uh, agencies as well. Um, to be able to collect the cuttings that they do through standards, operations, and maintenance, to be able to not have those go into the landfills to increase our carbon emissions, but rather uh, we make our medicines out of them. This year, I'm currently going to be making food out of uh, some of our locations uh, that are incorporated with schools and, and uh, other um, uh, uh, locations here in LA, um, as well as uh, once we take that biomass and we use it for our purposes, we then work alongside um, uh, LA Compost and they take our biomass and they will uh, 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 regenerate it back into the soil. So we have a full cycle of what's going in. But I have a lot to say about what's being discussed today. So, but I wanna give the other folks a, a, a chance to speak because uh, we have a different perspective on what's being discussed here today. Um, so I would love to be able to share that with you. I can, pro I can probably talk two, three hours on this subject. So I hope I have some time okay, to be able to- uh, We have uh, two minutes discuss. left. So thank you so much for your introduction. And uh, Tanya is actually gonna be moderating this part. So Tanya, you take the speakers away now and they're going to be introducing themselves and a little bit of the topic that they're gonna discuss. So I will say maybe go with Ali since she seems the next one on the screen. 
Sure. Thank you, Aura, and um, nice to see everyone today. My name is Ali Frazzini. I'm a policy advisor within the county's chief sustainability office. Um, my background's in public health, um, and so I very much bring the lens of always thinking about how what we're doing in the environment affects health and, um, and what are the health impacts, positive and negative, of any decisions we might make. And um, my office is, uh, we, again, we're within county government, so that's larger than LA City. It actually covers 88 cities across the region, um, and there are 10 million people within LA County. Um, so the, the government itself is quite large, and my office um, doesn't sit within a specific department. We sort of sit between the county departments and the Board of Supervisors, those are elected officials, um, to be able to, to work with both and work across departments um, to really provide you know, some uh, support and guidance on uh, how to create a more sustainable region. And uh, my work supports uh, the mitigation of natural disasters in particular as relates to climate change. Um, my, I work with community members and researchers to identify the impacts of climate change that we're seeing already, um, especially in places that are already burdened by pollution and other problems creating, created by, you know, historical policies and industries that our region grew up with. Um, and uh, also we look at what strategies will enable people in the land to be healthy and safe as the climate continues to change. Um, and then we also, you know, we really work to highlight solutions. So, you know, multi-benefit and community-driven solutions that the government should support. That can be things like, you know, shrinking the amount of land we pave over for roads and parking lots and repurposing it for natural features, such as bioswales that, that have the greenery that makes our air healthier and can serve as habitat and help capture stormwater. Um, so those are some examples of, of what we work on. Um, and uh, I also work on food solutions and thinking about policy opportunities um, to support uh, urban agriculture and uh, uplifting community-driven food production efforts. So I can, uh, I'll, I'll keep, I'll hold on sharing any more details until we go into questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Moses, do you wanna go next? Yes, my name is Moses Massenberg. I am primarily trained as a historian I focus on African-American women's intellectual history, um, but because of the way that academic institutions are structured, I take my talents to uh, farming and gardening spaces in urban environments so that I can engage um, women and children, especially like Latinx women and black women in uh, history and the intersections of history and environmentalism, for example, um, we'll go to Southern plantations and we'll do archeological digs for seeds such as fennel. Um, we'll do surveying of trees such as Moringa trees. And then we'll do historical mapping to see how those trees and how those seeds arrived on Southern plantations mm -hmm. um, to sort of present evidence of how black women in the African diaspora braided Moringa seeds, rice seeds, okra seeds and fennel seeds into the children, into the heads of their children before they were transported across the Atlantic in slavery. Um, and we use that as an, an incentive or initiative to get more black women and black children involved in urban agriculture and in agriculture in general, um, because a lot of nonprofits struggle internally with how to get more black people involved in a system that they've been involved with since the beginning of, of this nation. So um, fennel, moringa, and other crops were used um, um, to, to produce uh, breast milk and to aid with lactation for black mothers on plantations, who then in turn were wet nurses for white children of slave owners who owned the plantations, which then became the multinational corporations such as Monsanto, Wells Fargo, and so on and so forth that control most of land use. So we use history and we use agricultural knowledge to bridge the gap between history, identity, and agricultural production. Thank you, Moses. And thank you for having a live reactor right there. <laughs> Love the faces. And Nathan, wanna go next? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Nathan Liu. Uh, I am the executive director and co-founder of Mongol Tribe. We're a grassroots nonprofit in San Diego that's bridging health and wellness and civic ecology. 
Um, I'm uh, mostly from the Southeast Asian area, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, Sri Lankan, Mongolian, um, Indian, Punjabi, and uh, some Peruvian. So my, my background is built upon a lot of traditional knowledge and land uh, stewardship and care. And uh, so my focused work now is uh, in uh, forest health and uh, eco restoration, using traditional ecological knowledge as um, a care strategy for, you know, the the solutions of this time. So um, my my background is in uh, agriculture and natural resources, and this has brought me an interest into uh, both the food systems and the ecological aspects of um, environmental systems. So uh, my work is kind of intersectional in that manner. And primarily right now I'm working in oak woodland health and uh, addressing uh, the gold spotted oak borer and the impact it's having on uh, our oaks in Southern California and uh, changing the narrative back to um, the oak woodlands not being a wild land, but one of uh, indigenous food forests. So thank you so much for having me. Of course, thank you. And certainly last, but no, last, but certainly not least, Koki or Wildcat? Hi, my name is William Wildcat. Um, Wildcat was a mistranslation of the brother I was named after, Kwakichi, which means little panther. I go by Kwaki, which means panther. I was born into a, a, an indigenous culture. I'm from the Oklahoma Seminole Nation. I'm a cougar clan, Thomas Palmer Band. Um, that that culture does um, polyculture, organic farming, and I was um, born into that culture and, and picking, you know, green beans and even okra and crops from other continents that came to us um, from our relationships with um, the Africans who escaped from plantations some hundreds of years ago. They've been an integral part of our history for a long time and uh, changed our relationship with ecology and all of the clans of divine beings we're in relation with. Um, I began tending my first organic farm when I was five years old. It's about 38 years of organic farming. And um, I moved into eventually super biodiverse polyculture, began studying soil microbiology, began studying um, the ways that organic biodiverse polyculture farms interact with the ecology around, got into food forestry, got into wildland reforestation, the Bill Zedek, Earthworks, Slow It, Spread It, Sink It, how, figuring out how to use uh, geology transformation to keep water from leaving the surface of the earth. And um, lately I've been studying desert reforestation and ancient ancestral indigenous uh, land management practices, re, uh, regenerative horticulture practices from around the world, including um, the Milpa in Central America, um, been going down there to study how people have uh, transformed, how people transformed more than 10,000 years ago that arid grassland into the tropical rainforest and then maintained it through unbelievable droughts over the millennia. Um, and studying um, other systems like that and then modern uh, regenerative horticultural systems such as centropic agriculture coming up from Brazil, which incorporates the indigenous uh, regenerative horticulture, rege um, regenerative agroforestry practices have been practiced down there for uh, thousands of years. And um, sort of, and then I've studied, you know, botany and ecology and mycology and soil science through, through the Western um, science lens also. And I've tried to uh, bring all of these schools of thought into one coherent school of thought that um, speaks to how we restore, agri restore ecology, restore nutrient cycling and nutrient densities in the foods. Um, specifically how to increase food production and how to um, mitigate the impacts of natural disasters and climate change for a long time. And so all of the work that I do and um, and I do research and practice and education, and it all relates directly to the subjects we're talking about today. Thank you so much to all our panelists for being here. Of course, in the interest of time, we're barely going to scratch the surface. I encourage everyone participating today at this conference to really go to all the websites, go to all the resources that all our panelists are sharing, because clearly they have a lot of knowledge that we cannot cover today, unfortunately. So I'm going to pose a question, and then we're going to go in the same order that we just went. And so the first question is, how can ecological restoration reduce the effects of the climate crisis, especially here in LA? We have Quoki in New Mexico, which is experiencing similar things. So we're talking about drought, we're talking about flash flooding, the th different things we talked about. How can we reduce that through ecological restoration 
while making sure that all communities are part of this. We've already mentioned intersectionality, making sure Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized communities are leading these solutions and making sure that they are being protected as well. So Matt, do you want to start us off? Sure. I, I just want to uh, throw out one of the main concerns that's been uh, hitting me throughout this whole discussion is uh, I believe a misguided premise about our LA landscape. Uh, LA was never meant for farming. And that concept actually is what destroyed our diversity here. And that reality is what needs to happen in terms of our stewardship of our land. Uh, when the Spanish came in, they brought in their wine grapes. That's what they sold back to the Spain to be able to pr produce for the missions that are here. Um, this monotypic use of our landscape is not the way our LA landscape was designed, with the way the basin was designed to function. By utilizing, by understanding our native flora, they will help benefit our native fauna, which will help benefit the, the, the human population. Just let me tell you just one quick story to help you understand this reality. Willow, willow is one of our main uh, 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 riparian trees that grow here. Hmm. Now, willow comes from salix. Salix, I'm gonna talk to a little science right now, just real quick. Salix produces a compound called salicin. Salicin is actually the uh, uh, a main ingredient that uh, goes in aspirin, that goes in wart remover, it, it produces salicylic acid. But realize when we take salicin, the, the, the way that used to be, you, you chew on a little branch and you would get salicin in you. But realize salicin is not recognized by our body. Actually, there's a little critter that lives in us that recognizes salicin. That little critter is a whole separate DNA than our whole, than ourselves. That critter are probiotics. These are the, 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 the little um, yeast and the bacteria that help to identify. So check this out. When you uh, ingest salicin, these probiotics understand what that is and they repackage it into a product called soliginin. Our body then recognizes soliginin, reproduces, metabolizes in our liver and shows it up to be salicylic acid so we can get the therapeutic benefit. But this is the lesson that we're learning from, from Willow. Willow is teaching us that without the relationship that we have between that little probiotic and ourselves, we don't get any benefits. And that's the learning that we're being taught every day because here's a little simple other concept. The plants and animals are elders. Why are they elders? In our origin story, we have plants and animals that are put here on our earth before us. Therefore, they're older than us. In our synchronization, in, in our sequence of when things happen, something that's older is meant to teach you. It's meant to learn from. We do not have that relationship today with our native flora and fauna. We are now importing different plants to farm on our landscape that could be utilized by our native flora. And check it out. Native flora provides us monoterpenoids, sesquiterpenes, flavonoids. I can go on and on. But the therapeutic values that we're missing out on because we're incorporating plants that are not from this land is what is pro prolonging this uh, depravity that we're experiencing on our landscape. So I just want to urge everyone that in the ecological restoration of our landscape, we all need to start developing relationships with the native plants and animals. And you can still do that in a farming technique. I do not want to disparage farming. That is not my intent at all. My intent is to help to have folks build their relationships with the plants that came from their landscape that have always provided for humans for thousands of years in food, medicine, and structure. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Ali, what do you think about um, restoring our, our native ecosystems and how we can make sure everyone's a part of it? Yeah, thanks, and I really appreciate those points from Matt. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I made wrote in my own notes is how I wanted to respond to this question was to talk about drought and how, you know, drought is, yes, a function of how much rain is coming from the sky, which has changed because of climate change. Um, but in our region, it's been uh, the impacts of it been, have been greatly exacerbated by the fact that our aquifers are completely overdrawn. And so that means that you know, people who used to use wells to get their household water now sometimes cannot and um, our the water quality is declining and um, that is a, a result of the type of thing that Matt talked about of how we've, uh, you know, historically people have brought in a bunch of water intensive crops and farmed, you know, LA but also the areas north of us where we get a lot of our food from, um, you know, uh, with these crops that really aren't 
uh, sustainable on the on the land that we live. And um, so I think there, you know, we need a, a large scale transition of the types of food that are grown. Um, you know, I also want to talk about flash flooding, um, another issue that has uh, been greatly exacerbated by how we've developed the land over time. Um, you know, the amount of rain that comes from the sky uh, has a relationship with the amount that pools in our surfaces, but um, the, the actual, you know, uh, amount of flooding that we see in our streets or, you know, other places that cause harm um, is high, highly, highly due to the fact that we've channelized our waterways in the LA region region and paved over a lot of our land surface area. And so that water can't be absorbed. Um, and one of the things that we're really going to need to do is, is depave and, um, you know, make some of those spaces, um, you know, more, more natural spaces, uh, you know, put, put uh, plants back that can support the health of the land as it should be. I love how we're just building on each other. That's amazing. Moses, what are your thoughts? I think a lot of folks here are probably familiar with Rachel Carson. She's one of our greatest ancestors in the environmental movement. She talked about the importance of dechemicalizing dechemical um, in her book here, Silent Spring. Um, but one of the things that we don't discuss enough or we don't engage enough is the silent racism in the contemporary American uh, environmental movement. Um, historically, Black people, particularly Black women and children, have been against environmental pollution in their neighborhoods because they've been relegated to, to living housed or unhoused in undesirable parts of the United States. So those are on flood plains, those are on formal, former chemical sites, those are where oil companies have ravaged land, as where, where there's no high property taxes and so on and so forth. If we stop operating from the notion that there are people who don't necessarily care as much as other people because they don't have the time or the luxury to be as loud or to be as involved or as fancy in their resistance to environmental racism, then we'll start to realize that environmental racism affects us all. So if the majority of food stamp recipients or EBT recipients for cash assistance in the United States are white people, those are poor white people. Poor white people and black people in environmentally racist districts are subjected to some of the same toxins and some of the same policies that disenfranchise native and indigenous peoples at pipelines in, in the Dakotas, that disenfranchise folks in New Orleans after post Katrina, and that are the reason that crises like what happened in Flint, Michigan happen all over the place. Now Flint, Michigan didn't, it's not something that just recently happened, it's been happening since the beginning of time. But if, if we realize that Black people, that poor people have been at the center of mitigating climate change and the results of catastrophe because they live at the epicenter of where those things begin, then we can think, think, we can think of things differently. And I don't just mean in the United States. I mean all across, the, all across the world. So in Nigeria, where the Shell Corporation has been largely unregulated and able to extract for oil, and Black women and children have suffered not only as laborers on those facilities, but as victims of the, the, the fact that their, their soil then becomes hydrophobic and they cannot grow to survive, or that they're paid pennies to extract diamonds, blood diamonds in, in the Congo, or rubber for the Firestone Corporation, then we'll start to think more globally and we'll start to see that if you're in Watts or in your, if you're in Compton, and Whole Foods and Trader Joe's won't develop in your community because they believe that people will steal, that that has a lot more to do with the way people think than it does with whether or not people will consume. Now, if you, if you go to any food distribution in Watts or any food distribution in Compton or any food distribution in Inglewood where recovered food from these, these high-line grocery stores is then trucked into our communities, Black and brown people don't just throw things away and say, hey, we don't want that. They take their knives and they take their, they take their tools and they cut the bad parts of the fruit off and redirect it into composting wind rolls, redirect it into systems where carbon sequestration and water sequestration happens. They take the good food and the parts of those food and they eat it. But 
nonprofit organizations, no disrespect to any nonprofit heads here, who get government grants systematically and are then able to establish salary positions for people who live in Beverly Hills, who live in Westwood and Pasadena and Westchester and don't live in the places where environmental degradation happens, come into our communities and tell us, we need you to volunteer for us so that we can meet our deliverables, take pictures of you for social media, and then use that data to justify us getting more money for free all day when we have to take care of our children and we have to struggle to keep our households afront and we don't even have enough money to keep our, our, our rent paid are telling us this is how you do carbon sequestration, but Las Donas, the grandmothers down the street, the, the immigrants that have been, that been coming here all, all to, to escape all the problems created by US neoliberal policies, are telling us how to sequester carbon more effectively than the nonprofit heads themselves and what chippy lean is and what chayotes are and what cucumbers can do for us and how moringa helps with breast milk and what insulin plants help remedy diabetes, then we have a problem. But people don't wanna to listen to us here. So that's why it's important for us to continue to have discussions amongst ourselves and allow ourselves to be visible on platforms like this so that our allies can be true allies and not just allies who, who get the money and speak to speak to speak but don't come into the hood and really know that we also have the knowledge that they believe that all these phd holders possess thank you yes yeah, super important you do not need a phd to know any of this for sure nathan yeah thank you so much so i love that this conversation is moving back to um re-indigenizing Right, because it's really a part about uh, awakening back to our our knowing, and there's so much that the land can teach us that is already there. We just have to frame our perspective so that way we can see it and witness it, and that's a part of what I'm doing on the mountain in Palomar. Um, you know, this oak woodland, I'm I'm spending the time just to witness and observe, and there's so much food and medicine around. Like Matt, you know, has talked about, it's like you just have to know how to use that medicine and that process of which you know we can restore the land. And so we're starting really with with soil health. And so a lot of our um, current approved protocols are um, ones that are chemical based treatments or ones that are focused on mastication and heavy machinery, when in reality, we could be doing this with hand tools and we could be doing this very gently and mindfully. And when you open up that forest floor, you realize there are hundreds of baby oaks amongst it that you would have driven right over had you brought that machinery in there. You would have destroyed the soil biology and along with the process. So what we're hoping for and what we're uh, looking to institutionalize is a process that is built upon traditional ecological knowledge, one that looks at the forest as a whole system. And so the idea is that we can restore the soil forest health through a uh, simple uh, bringing down those fuel loads, those ladder loads, fuels, ladder fuels are, are a key concern. And that biomass becomes a, a, a huge value for soil, uh, soil duff development. And also we're browsing animals through it. So using silvo pasture is a key functional opportunity to do land restoration. And, you know, in the process, our focus is really integrated pest management, looking at the oaks. And so we're creating a program to, um, to, to train and teach how to uh, care for that and identify those secondary value functions, including wood milling, mushroom log inoculation, um, biochar, uh, bioswales, you know, uh, and, and then also going back into the indigenous practices of cultural burning, one that actually stimulates the water to return to the surface for a, a protection of the oaks and their uh, mycelial uh, root systems. And so there's uh, so much awareness about these practices that when we look at that as a whole, we realize that the solutions really build and compound upon each other. So when you restore the soil health, and you open up the access for the animals to move through, you open up the sunlight for the shrubs and the medicines and foods to grow, then you start to see all the turkeys coming back. You start to see all the birds supporting your invest in integrated pest management, right? The, the woodpeckers can catch up to the beetle populations. So, you know, the impact of the forest up in the headwaters is critical. And I love the discussion about building those pools and the, the use of beavers. And right now we're having to use check jams that we build by hand. And those, a lot of times in riparian zones, have huge costs for uh, permitting. So, you know, the, the solutions right now really are, uh, there's a lot, of, as my uncle would say, there's a lot of white tape, right? There's a lot of bureaucratic barriers that, you know, white people have put in place 
to limit the opportunity that our indigenous communities have historically brought to the table. And so we're really looking for how do we um, you know, partner with the municipalities and the counties and the, these various organizations to uplift these practices so that way there is an opportunity for us to actually share. Because like Moses said, not all of us have PhDs, but we do have a lot of on, on the ground experience and a lot of our elders that we heard stories from has showed us solutions that are practical. So, you know, I'm hopeful that these kind of conversations can open up those doorways to where the funding and the education can align where we're learning from people that look like us. So that way we can move this back into purpose in place that results in a pathway to reparations and land back. Thank you, Nathan. I love that idea of collaborating across sectors. We definitely need that. This is an all encompassing crisis. We can't just stick with the environmental sector, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Koki, do you want to finish off with how do we get this going? Yeah, and I, I just want to say I feel really honored to be in this group and to be listening to this conversation. I really appreciate every one of you a whole lot. There's a lot alive in me, and I think that we're going to, um, we have heard and um, are going to continue to hear the specifics of how do we do this. And I just want to speak on what's alive in me right now. Um, you know, we're in, like, there's not going to be ecological justice if there's not social justice. That's impossible. There's not going to be social justice if there's not ecological justice. That's impossible. And so, like, I'm really moved by this conversation. Um, you know, Native American people, I mean, we're like, we're in this country that's based off of brutal white supremacy, human supremacy, um, brutal ecocide, brutal genocide, races created from rape. We're in a rape culture, like extraction, take everything you want at any cost. And especially if you're a white man, you get away with that no matter what. And like, that's virtuous by the value system of our, of this culture. And that's, um, caused so many problems, causes so many problems. We're all suffering from this. We're in global ecological collapse because of this. And so, you know, Native America, so this, the economy and this whole system has been built off of, I mean, every aspect, ec economic, energy system, food, water, education, healthcare, all the social systems, everything has been built off of all of this brutality and this hierarchical brutality, white supremacist, male supremacist, human supremacist brutality. Native Americans still legally by treaties, which should be honored by international law, still legally own more than 35% of the area of continental United States, occupy 2% or less. Um, what fraction do the descendants of Africans who were brought over here by force occupy, like own the right to manage themselves? How can there be food sovereignty if we don't have land access? How can African Americans have food sovereignty if they don't have land access? How can natives have food sovereignty? How can any poor people, any people in this country have food sovereignty? And if they don't have food sovereignty and water sovereignty, then they don't have sovereignty. They don't have autonomy. You know, we have to start about this. Any conversation about social justice, and again, we cannot have ecological health on this planet until we have social justice. Any conversation about social, about restoring social equilibrium, restoring social justice has to begin with an acknowledgement of the power dynamics in a situation. And so when a small fraction of the population gets to control a very large fraction of the land mass, then that small fraction gets to control um, the food and the water and everything. And then the majority do not have food sovereignty or water sovereignty. And I think we can't have conversations about ecological health or ecological justice or regeneration or any of this if we don't begin by talking about power differentials. And how do we restore power differentials? What do reparations look like to get African Americans and native people and poor white people and poor uh, Vietnamese and Polish and Russian people and poor city folks, people who are beautiful mutts like all of us who don't even know who their ancestors are. Everybody, every community in this country needs food sovereignty, food autonomy, clean water, um, the medicine sovereignty, like the ability to make all their food, fiber, clothing, medicine, dyes, every material they need for art and music and everything from the land, from the ecosystems that they're a part of in society with all these other clans of divine beings, everybody has the right to that. And um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, do I have another 30 seconds where I'm at? Go for it. Okay, um, a, a couple other things real quick. The amount of water that's coming through an ecosystem is not directly proportional to the amount of biomass which is possible to be grown in that system. We see that in the ancient form of milpa where they kept tropical rainforests intact. And we know this 
Western science knows it, it doesn't matter because we have this in the oral traditions of the indigenous peoples down there, but Western science knows this through analyzing the um, pollen records and the rainfall records and the archeologic records that they kept tropical rainforests over a large fraction of Mesoamerica during droughts way worse than what Arizona and New Mexico and Southern California are going through right now. And is through intelligent land management, these technologies, these regenerative ecological technologies that indigenous people were practicing for more than 10, have been practicing for more than 10,000 years uninterrupted. Um, so there's a, an idea that the amount of water in an ecosystem is directly proportional to the biomass, which is possible, but that's not true at all. There's a, orders of magnitude of variance in that potentiality based on how you're managing that land, what type of relationship you're in with that land. Um, and yeah, just to speak to that before and after of like uh, Richard's before carbon slide, this is what horticulture looked like. That's one of the ways horticulture looked like. There are indigenous peoples all over North and South America, Africa, Southeastern Asia, like all over the world who were practicing continental scale ecological management in very responsible, beneficial ways. They knew how to do that. Um, uh, we uh, don't just need to stop killing beavers. We need to stop undoing their work. We have beavers in every waterway in New Mexico and we break every dam that they build. So um, we need to also stop undoing their work. And then, um, yeah, the geoforming piece, like we can geoform the earth to hold water, but that's not enough. If we just leave it there, the water will eventually disrespect whatever work we did. We have to do the ecological piece as well. We have to then um, do whatever, and I'll talk about this. I'm, today I'm gonna go through the specific fundamentals of ecological restoration and how do we increase water infiltration and biomass and uh, organic matter accumulation, nutrient cycling, all that. I can go into great detail about that and I can share resources with anybody who's interested. Um, but it's important that the geoforming can be a, a great place to start in a desert situation, but then we have to do the biologic piece also to create these forests again or whatever that ecosystem wants to be in a resilient way, incorporating native species. Thank you very much, Matt, and a bunch of other pieces that I will mention today. Thank you. Thank you. To clarify for everyone, Quokey's talking about his breakout discussion, which will happen after the panel discussion. So that's what he's saying. He'll, he'll have more time to talk. Um, and so we do have time for one more question, and then we'll go around the room again. So this next question is because we've been talking about it all day. Quokey actually talked about it a lot, but talking about food, when we talk about restoration, um, we may, people may think like conservation, the typical like let's restore wilderness or whatever. But no, when we talk about restoration here today, we're talking about how we do restoration in a way that works for everyone, for humans as well. And so what are we talking about? Um, how do we increase local food production to kind of go against those industrial agricultural systems that aren't working for us? Again, in a way to, to make sure that marginalized communities are a part of it and that they're benefiting from it. So Matt, take us away. So I'll try and make this quick. Uh, it's utilizing our natural spaces, how they've fed humans for thousands and thousands of years up until literally a few decades ago here in California. Um, Here's the reality. Are any of you familiar with saponins, saponins, tomato, tomato, however you want to say it? This is a main compound that was in many of our roots. Uh, all of our, uh, we were known as diggers, uh, where all of our uh, food was, was underground. That was all destroyed when the Spanish brought in the cattle. That ended up compacting all of our soil and renewing all of our annuals. But anyway, um, and if you look, many of our endangered species in Southern California are, are the onion species and uh, a lot of these tubers and bulbs uh, that were the main food source of yesteryear. Well, here's the, the reality. These compounds that are found in our indigenous plants, such as monoterpenoids, such as sesquiterpenes, these are compounds that work therapeutically in us. Uh, we make medicines that help with pain, that help with inflammation, that help with all these aspects that we are dealing with today, that you would get that therapy through your food. And we do not have those ingredients anymore anywhere available, at least in California, and that's what we're trying to bring back is not just think about food as importing into LA, but utilizing the food that's already here, that's being wasted every year in our you know, uh, uh, um, annual operations and maintenance of our landscape and the wildfires that happen and not understanding our native flora. And by not understanding it, we are wasting not only the, the, the nutrition, um, but also the the, the flavors that we are missing out. I mean, much of our uh, endangered species, as a biologist, I've, I've worked on many projects and some of those projects we had to uh, remove some endangered species because they were in the pathway of uh, um, our infrastructure development. 
uh, and so they're allowed to be removed. In that, they were just going to be thrown away. I was able to cook them, uh, create a meal out of them that provided us supplements to our health that literally for me, I have um, uh, medical issues that I could talk to you about, but inflammation is one of my big things. I literally felt a night and day a difference by intaking these compounds that are not regular forms of our nutrition. And this is what we have to start learning and get the relationships is that nutritional and flavor value that we're missing out on that have only been removed from us in these last decades. And that's the, the truth of it. We can still get it back, but we have to do the work. And I, I am so thankful for being with everyone in this conversation. I thank you all for your words that you guys are saying today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Matt. Yeah, I know when we think of plants and med as medicine, people think rainforests. And so they think like, it's not California, it's not here. So I agree, we need to think of where we're living now and what's around us. Ali, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Well, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this uh, question from the perspective of, you know, what are the policy levers to potentially um, enable local food production? Um, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in, uh, you know, how to grow food or what types of food to grow, but um, definitely want to uh, leverage governmental authority and power as much as possible to um, support the, you know, production of the types of foods that can can sustain people and um, empower communities <clears throat> and, uh, you know, provide food sovereignty. And so, you know, I've heard many times from urban farmers in this area that one of the biggest barriers in the LA region is cost, uh, especially of cost of land. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, government can and occasionally does release grants uh, to support small farmers. Um, there's, I think, a new state program, for example, uh, this coming year that will be releasing grants. But uh, those tend to be, you know, few. The funding is unreliable. It's not a not a sustainable source of funding. And um, so one of the most powerful tools we have as a government is the fact that we procure a lot of food. We buy a lot of food, you know, for the school meals that are, you know, uh, fed to children and for senior meal programs. And, um, we, you know, we, we pay for large, large amounts of food and um, we can use the power of, you know, the government dollar to be paying for food that is produced in more regenerative ways, that is produced by, uh, you know, the people with the knowledge of how to, um, you know, manage the land, steward the land um, by, you know, small local growers of color. And, you know, that would mean that we would need to pay more for the food that is produced without negative externalities. Um, and uh, we'll need to dedicate more of our public funding towards that um, and to investing in changes in the food supply chain that can uh, help support, you know, the, the uh, amounts of food sort of gathered from many different growers as opposed to getting huge amounts from, you know, one grower in the Central Valley um, and using uh, that for our public programs. Um, I'm also looking at how to facilitate access to land that is owned by public entities that maybe, you know, is not currently being utilized. Um, and, you know, whether there are ways to make it easier to establish agreements with growers um, uh, for, for growers to be able to, to use that land. Um, so those are, those are some of the steps that we're exploring and definitely welcome ideas from all of you. Thank you for the policy side, Ali, that's super helpful. I'm aware we're probably going to go past this timer here, but I do want to give all our panelists, the three that are left, just one chance to answer this question. I don't think we'll take questions from the audience, but um, we'll see what Luis says afterwards. So Moses, as a historian of agriculture, give us your thoughts on food. So um, just knowing what the origins of some of the food are, I think when we struggle to get young young people involved, especially young people of color, involved in agricultural production, food production, um, climate mitigation, it's often because these things are, are considered boring. So if, if, if we truly center these folks, if we center their identity in our dialogue, in our instruction, in the way that we go about disseminating information, and they see themselves reflected in the things that we do, then it'll be a matter of, of how excited these black and brown children are in this, in, this, in this inner city to know where sunflower seeds are on a sunflower head. Or to know, for example, that these 
that this corn, this here, this is a, a group of seeds. And then to teach them or to instill in them a sense of patience when they watch these things grow. But if we have corporations that are unchallenged, like for example, Delta Airlines, I hope they're not a sponsor, dumping fuel, jet fuel on our elementary schools, on the heads of our students in our community gardens, and then not being challenged or not being held accountable by local and regional regulators, then that's a problem. If I can hear and feel Southwest Airlines, Delta Airlines, uh, uh, all these national airlines over my head in my home, making my roof shake before they get to LAX a few miles west to land, that's a problem. But if I'm in Westchester at one of my friend's houses where the airport is actually located and I can't even hear the airplanes because the airplanes that, land, that are coming across their nose flight paths fly a few miles over the Pacific Ocean first and then turn around, then come back at, and land at the airport east just so those residents don't have to hear that noise, then there's a problem. So if we even if if our if the if the very soil in this ghetto that we're saying we want people to plant is hydrophobic and can't even absorb water, or is chemicalized and the only thing that we can plant here to do to do uh, uh, remediation toxic remediation it, are sunflowers, then that too is a problem. So instead instead of having people come in and tell us that these are problems, that our grandmothers can tell us otherwise because they're from places where these problems wouldn't exist without the Shell Corporation. Give us some money to work in front of our homes. Don't send organizations in here to plant trees that we already have in our front yards and, 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 and bring volunteers from the very corporations like Boeing and Delta Airlines and so on and so forth to get photo ops with our children as they look through the windows of their homes with bars on the windows to, to say, oh, I wanna learn how to plant a tree. Like if you guys are so, like if you, you think we criminals, you think we gang members, we like we from Grape Street Crip or whatever. This is called it's old Grape Street is named because grapes used to be grown here, right? If we have Anzac, we have street names after indigenous peoples, we have street street names after California natives, but we don't we we don't even know why these street names are named those because our local school systems don't have us in the center of their curriculum. That needs to change as well. So it's not just a matter of growing food and making food accessible. It's a, it's a matter of revolutionizing curriculum to put black, indigenous, brown, native, and poor people at the, begin, at, the, at the center of it, and also allowing our children to do more than just sit at a desk and learn, but to use their hand, to use what they smell, to use what they see, to incorporate learning about themselves into being stewards of the environment, and also getting learning to get paid to do it. Yes, create jobs, more environmental jobs, restoration jobs. Love that. Nathan? Yeah, so I have a couple of brief thoughts on this. Um, first thing I want to point out is like uh, something that I was working on in San Diego has been to be able to help uh, public food forests be able to be installed in our uh, park systems. Uh, we had actually a policy that allowed for community gardens, but it wasn't allowing for the opportunity for food forests to be integrated in that same uh, tool set. And so we actually had to get a code change that updated and added open park spaces into that allowability. So that way we could actually have a project like a food forest, public food forest be approved. So, you know, things like that are, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Like I said, there's, there's opportunity. The, the challenge is now is how, now that Justice 40 has been released and now that we have, um, you know, 30 by 30 as a toolkit that, you know, um, I'm sure Matt can reflect on this too, is that, you know, all of our indigenous practices check every single box of, and, um, you know, we need support to build capacity. So we're, we need partners like the resource conservation districts and other administrative and fiscal arms that can support us in acquiring those resources that our organizations don't even have capacity to apply for. So, you know, we're going through a big transition right now where there's a lot of resources available, but we still need technical assistance. We still need organizational capacity. And so there is like a process to building that. And the current non nonprofit industrial complex is not solving those issues. It's creating more difficulty at times. So what we need to be moving into is more working board co-ops, which Moses, I'm sure you can speak to more as the black community and especially around farming really centered that development of working-based co-ops. And these are a solution that puts purpose in place 
And this is a pathway to reparations. We need to open this door so that resources can funnel down into our community's hands so they can learn to embody and step into these $100 an hour jobs. We need to stop being short-sighted in this and say, yeah, great, we're going for $20 an hour. In reality, you know, our brace are paid a significant amount more than that. So let's be really solution oriented and acknowledge the value of what our communities can bring to the table. And let's pay them fairly and equitably based on, you know, again, if the industry standard says I should be making $250 an hour to climb a tree, then I don't want to be devalued because I don't have that licensure and can't afford it, even though I'm totally qualified for that programming. So, you know, for me, that's where like, I always have in the back of my mind, yeah, I'm training to be a professional forester and all these things because one, we need representation. And two, I know it creates equity and opportunity in the current state of things, but I'm building a bridge and I'm hopeful that we can work together to build this bridge because there is an opportunity for us to re reintegrate these solutions and work together cohesively to uplift our each other's projects. So that's for me, my hope around the food system is that for me, I, it started out as like seed libraries, just as a simple idea, right? Is more seed libraries, more access, right? If we can get food and access into the hands of people that already have experience, then we can be, you know, again, stepping out of some of those costs, but it's going to take collective solutions. And that means uh, quality partnerships. Yes, solidarity and redistrib redistribution, re redistribution of resources. Totally agree. Koki? Yeah. Uh, again, really floored and humbled at this conversation. Really appreciate every one of you. I'm, uh, I have a lot moving through me right now and it's circulating them. And um, yeah, I'm trying to find what is alive for me right now in all of this. And I think I'm going to speak. Um, I, I am hearing uh, what, what Moses is saying about what value is learning the fundamentals of ecological restoration or regenerative horticulture or receiving any type of advice when you're in such a stressful situation that you don't have um you know you can't meet your basic needs you know and um that's yeah that's really profound and and um, for me right now thinking about that and feeling that and i've I li i've lived in chicago and kansas city and denver and dallas um so some big cities and i've lived I'm from a, a native reservation in Oklahoma, which was very rural. And right now I live out in the middle of nowhere in Southern New Mexico. I'm in Southern New Mexico in the Gila wilderness area right now. And so since we have other people speaking to the um, city experience, I'm just gonna speak real quickly to the rural experience. Um, where you have access to land where there's land right around you that nobody, I mean, it might be BLM, it might be something else, it might like technically not be legally yours, but there's no one coming by ever. And so you can just start guerrilla food foresting, no problem. You can, you have a backyard, you have a front yard. I, I have a lot of friends who live in giant, like, you know, a thousand people in one square block living 40 stories up. Um, but where I live and where a lot of poor people live, you have a front and a backyard and you have wild land right next to you. you can walk down to the creek which is now dry and you can begin native plant reforestation strategies which will bring water back to that river and that creek and so i'm just going to speak real quick to what these principles are i'm going to go through them and not um, give any much detail just get them said for the people who are not going to follow us into the breakout room um, the, the fundamental principles of regenerative horticulture of desert reforestation of food forestry of any type of ecological restoration on land that's not wetland specifically. Um, the, some of the big ones are these accumulating organic matter. And that means like mulching and plants to mulch and then you don't cut them down. You never pull them out by the roots. You just take a third off the top and drop that mulch so that they release the sugars into the soil food web and stimulate nutrient cycling. And but they still have their photosynthetic capacity. So they keep growing back and then the nutrient cycling stimulate like it benefited everybody and the organic matter that accumulates on the surface once it's done going through its rotting process and people eating those people who are eating that and people eating those people, right? what's left is topsoil, organic matter, no mineral component. That's how we make topsoil. Accumulating biomass, which is the living part of that. And accumulating biomass almost sounds like the same thing as like increasing food production. Um, but it really ties into other things. And so like not pulling out those plants that you don't want, not fighting the weeds, which are the early successional species, which are all foods and medicines, you know, but taking advantage of them, respecting those native species who want to grow right there, who are bringing you free food, accumulating biodiversity, the different 
categories of plants feed different categories of microbes and fungi who do different pieces of the collective nutrient cycling. And that was speaking to this in a really articulate, beautiful, powerful way, which I appreciate. Um, the more categories of species of plants that you have present in the system, the more robust the collective nutrient cycling, the more foods and medicines, and the vast majority of nutrients are complex organic molecules, which fungi specifically are making, which are not have like metals, like calcium, cobalt, iron, whatever you think of like plant nutrients, thousands of medicines that can be present in a tomato or cannot be present in a tomato. And any tomato from the farmer's market is not, they're not present in that because they're not doing super biodiverse polyculture. That's organic farming and organic farming is like business as usual. It's the same exact chemical warfare model. We're pouring these salts on the earth that kill all the soil biology and have less than 1% of all the foods and medicines present that the plant could use in it. And so um, accumulating plant biodiversity, you have to do that to have a resilient system. Um, combining perennials and annuals together. Um, again, this is working towards the resilience of the system, um, focusing on native species, getting as many native species in there as possible. If you're just doing wildland reforestation, it's all native species. If you're doing food forestry, you're mixing native and non-native species and really thinking about the non-native species which will thrive in that system because again, you're looking for resilience. Um, regenerative horticulture looks like mixing perennials and annuals so that you get all the food, fiber, fuel, medicine, everything that you need from that system. And you're still focusing on as many native species as possible. And you're doing it in a way because you have these, um, the perennials in there too. If that farm ever goes fallow, what you have is a highly productive food forest. Whereas if the organic farm that the tomato at your farmer's market comes from ever goes fallow, that turns back to a desert immediately. And there's a big difference. Um, getting trees in there, and that's a part of the resilience, and that's a part of it being a, a functional food forest, a functional system once it goes fallow. Get, you have to have, but the lignin also, because how do you clean up those toxins in the soil in that poor community at the surface? They are the saprophytic fungi, the decomposer fungi, who have all those amazing um, hormones that have the genes to make those, I'm sorry, enzymes that can break down glyphosate, break down neonicotinoids, break down whatever the exhaust is from those airplanes. You know, it's the saprophytic fungi and the saprophytic fungi, the decomposite fungi, they eat lignin, wood. You have to have wood in that system to have the powerful uh, microremediators present in the system. So you have to have trees and shrubs present in that system. Uh, density, like when we plant Miyawaki forests, you have to have a certain density, three to five to seven trees per square meter. That sounds crazy to most Americans because we've had to extrude our worldview, our cosmology through the lens of competition for so long that we we have this fallacious, this wrong mythology that plants are competing for water, that plants are competing for light, that plants are competing for nutrients, plants are sharing and making more and bringing water. And they have mycorrhizal networks, interspecies fungal, the different species of fungi that are sharing with each other, communicating for different species of trees and everybody's getting what they need together because there's so much biodiversity and because they're close enough together that their mycorrhizal networks connect uh, density. And for a lot of other reasons too, uh, having all the canopy layers present um, to where you have full evapotranspiration going. So the biotic pump dynamics are processing at full speed and that's cooling the earth. And that is uh, regulating the global hydraulic cycle, which is mitigating natural disasters, the rate and severity of natural disasters, as well as increasing all the water infiltration and everything else to where you're mitigating the impacts of those natural disasters on the local level. Um, I'm going to throw in a shout out for those early successional species again. They're, they're all foods and medicines, every one of them. Everything you think of as a weed is a food, it's a medicine, and it's doing a specific thing that only that plant can do to repair the damage that we've done to get that earth back to where we can have forests and biodiversity again. And everything that's just is. And if you, so if you don't like Russian thistle tumbleweed, or if you don't like whatever that weed is that you don't like, grow that weed. And also, re, weed is a derogatory term. These are like, you know, spiritually conscious divine beings that we're in relationship with. These are beings who, who are an immune system response of Mother Earth who are doing exactly what the Earth needs to undo the damage that we've done to get it back where they, they don't have to be the prominent species again, not dominant and like the colonial worldview again, but the prominent species. Um, if you don't like Russian thistle, grow Russian thistle. It'll get you back to the next stage of ecological succession where Rus Russian thistle doesn't uh, propagate uh, as prolifically. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to you and everyone. These are all great insights. I wish we could have more questions. Um, so I encourage all of the panelists, if you want people to follow up with you, put like whatever works best for you, email, um, social media handles, where can people follow your work? Just plug it in. And for the participants, I encourage you either to go to 
Koki and Nathan's breakout discussion or see which other one you want. And I think I'm going to turn it back to Aura now, but thank you again to our, all our panelists. I know I learned a lot, so this was really exciting. I just don't even know where to start or to end <laughs> with all the stuff that you guys shared. So many wisdom, so much wisdom, so many good resources in, in so many other different ways too that complement each other. Thank you so much, Ali, Moses, Nathan, Kua, Kai, I'm not missing somebody here, no. And Tanya, thank you so much for moderating this uh, part. This was so great. And please post your information so that we can follow you and, and strategize together and continue the work. You know, earlier we heard uh, from Angelinos from Green Schools, and I know that they're also very involved in curriculum around LAUSD. And, and, you know, making sure that environmentalism and environmental justice is included. So, you know, this is a great space for us to organize and to also get to know each other better and, and get on each other's radar so that we can, you know, hopefully grow and continue our work and, and make it bigger because to change everything, we're going to need everyone.